The last person we'll talk about is probably the most contemporaneous. She only died in, in 2017. Oh, um, geez. And she's one that Godsey um, was very connected to. Um, when Godsey was working, I think, undergraduate research or PhD, she got to know uh, our last person very, very well. And because that was her research subject. So our last person we're going to talk about tonight is Elena Lagodinova. Um, Elena Lagodinova is Bulgarian, so she's a part right. of Bulgaria rather than like the Soviet Union proper, but it's all a part of sort of Eastern Europe, Soviet bloc countries. And um, so she's born in 1930. So she's born, you know, uh, you know, she, as, as Godsey writes, a, tr a true red diaper baby, Lagodinova was born into a poor family of committed socialist revolutionaries. Right, we are live. Hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books with an anarchist and Marxist lens. And I'm here with my co-host, Justin Clark. Hi, Corey. How are you? Not too bad. Yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Excited about uh, being on the podcast tonight. Um, as I was saying in the pregame, we're just trying to figure out my lighting situation because I got different setups. So, you know, trying to make it a little bit better each time because I got a new camera now and um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it looks pretty good. I'm um, a little more ambient than it usually is. I'm usually more <laughs> lit, but I think it looks pretty good. And, yep. uh, I'm really excited to get into, um, I'm excited to get into our book tonight. Oh, we got some random geek over on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. Glad to see you. Thank you. Great to see you. So happy you're here. Thank you so much for always being a part of our, of our live streams. For sure. So, oh, and over on YouTube as well. So, <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the, the analytics on that for sure. For sure. <laughs> so I guess, what are we covering today? Tonight we're covering the book, um, Red Valkyries, um, five okay. less feminist lessons from five revolutionary women by Kristen Godsey, um, who I just think is fantastic. I've read two of her books now and, um, and I just, I think she's so fascinating and interesting and cool. So she is a professor of Eastern European history, um, and she's written th three popular books. Um, the newest one I think is called Everyday Utopias. Um, okay. This is the middle book, but her first book is the one that kind of grew out of a very cool New York Times um, op-ed that she did a few a few years ago called um, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, oh, okay. which is the name I of her I've first of popular one. book. Yeah. That book is excellent. I read that book too. And so we'll, so there might be bleed through of talking a little bit about that book and a little bit about this okay. book, but I really wanted to talk about women's history. Um, you know, and full disclaimer, you're getting, you know, two <laughs> cis white guys talking about women. So, you know, full yeah. disclaimer there, but, um, I try very hard when I'm figuring out our schedule and figuring out the books we're going to cover to kind of share a rich history, not just in, in terms of tendency or political ideology, but also of background. And so um, I really wanted to talk about this book because what she does in the book is kind of lay out that, you know, when we write the history of feminism or we think about women's studies, there are people that often get left out. And the ones who often get left out are the ones who are of revolutionary politics, and especially those from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, do we have a comment? Uh, just nonsequently it showed up on Twitter on or on Twitch. I mean, so hi, nonsequently. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, and so she talks about in the introduction, which is called bourgeois feminism and its discontents. Okay. She writes about how feminism and feminist studies and studies have really been limited by not including the voices and the stories of these revolutionary women who come out of Eastern Europe who are truly progressive forces for good. Right. And, and so she's trying to give people like a counter to the sort of like lean in feminism of say like a Sheryl Sandberg who used to run Facebook or may still run Facebook now or meta, whatever the world it's called now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, there's a way in which history is written that way where certain women are mentioned and certain women are not, or their stories right. are often kind of put to the wayside. Um, so in some respects, this episode will be sort of a spiritual sequel to um, 
uh, to use sort of Adam Johnson from Citations Needed's phrase, you know, it's a spiritual sequel right. um, to our episode on Angela Davis's Women Racing Class. Right. Um, Makes sense. And that book, um, which is fun because one of the people, one of the revolutionary women we'll be talking about uh, worked with Angela Davis and they met and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that uh, if you look at when Angela Davis is writing in women racing class, especially about the women's suffrage movement in the United States, about how black women were, were not just like, like um, sort of in unintentionally left out. They were intentionally left right. out of the discourse on suffrage because so many of the main backers of suffrage were white supremacists. Um, yeah. So they didn't want black women to vote. Right. So black women don't really get the right to vote until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. Um, and you could make the argument that they don't fully have voting rights in the United States yet because the, the civil rights, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act of 65 being slightly gutted by the Supreme Court over the years. Right. But, um, but yeah, so what this book is about is sort of a remedy to the, 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 the sort of leaving out of stories. Um, and I think that's really important. And I, and I, I want to take a moment just to sort of talk as a public historian about why it's really important to discuss those unheard voices or those voices that are left out of the discussion. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of it is public history, the, the field that I'm trained in, um, kind of grew out of what was called the new social history of the 1960s and 70s. You know, and the, so, the social historians at that time were really about trying to change who we were talking about. So instead of just talking about, you know, dead old white dudes who are mostly politicians, let's talk about women. Let's talk about African-Americans or, or blacks in general. Let's talk about native voices and indigenous right. voices. Um, and, you know, let's talk about queer voices and trans voices and recognize that history is, is filled with these people, that they didn't just sort of come up out of the social movements in the 1960s. They've always been here and yeah. they've been a part of it. And when you look at the achievements that the five women that we're going to be talking about tonight made um, in, in, in the, 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 the history of women's rights globally, um, that we, we really are at it. We've, it's been a historical disservice to not share their stories. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to be more conscious of like the chat. So like before I talk about our first <laughs> person, is there a chat person? Uh, just uh, some random geek said, yeah, voting rights in uh, the USA is uh, interesting history. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. I mean, you know, and we'll talk, maybe we'll talk about that in a future episode. Um, and we've talked a little bit about it with, um, with like the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, but yes. Um, and I think that while we've obviously debated like the benefits of, of electoralism, you know, the right to vote itself is, in my opinion, a sacros sacrosanct part of living in a sort of free society, in a, in a free and equal society. Right. That, you know, you should have the right to vote. You, and You should have a say in your society. Exactly. Right. <laughs> like it's, you know, and, and, you know, that's the bare, bare minimum, right? Like we're not yeah. asking for like workers councils yet. But like, <laughs> right. I mean, we, that would say. be great too. But like, at the bare minimum, right, that you have some sense of workers' rights. And so, you know, this book is wonderful. I highly recommend people read it. I mean, it's 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 just sort of a as a as a sort of starting point in terms of my impressions of the book. I really liked it. It's 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 very easy to read. You know, it's less. It's about two hundred pages, so it's very it's very quick to get through. There's a good audiobook version of it. Nice. Um, and so there's a way that people can kind of absorb this information if you want to learn more of the details. So yeah. definitely check it out. It's published by Verso Books, um, you know. And so before we uh, – so I just want to kind of get that out of the way before we got into the main person. So the five women that we'll be talking about tonight that make up the book are Ludmila Pavlyshenko, okay. Alexandra Kalantai, Nehezda Krupskaya, Anessa Armand, and Elena Lagodinova. Um, and uh, if I butchered any of their names – I, you know, I might have, but I tried I'm my best. I'm ashamed to say I don't know any of those names. So, <laughs> so we'll start first with talking about Ludmila Pavlyshenko. So you may not know her name, but you know who she is. Okay. She is the Soviet sniper. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> so Ludmila Pavlyshenko is the Soviet sniper. She had over 300 confirmed kills during World War II. Right. Um, she uh, was somebody who... Um, you know, she was born in, uh, I think 1916. Um, and so she is somebody who, 
uh, joins the armed forces, I think in like 1942. Okay. And at the time there, you know, in the U S during world war II, there was very strict sort of separations of the sexes. You know, a lot of the men went off on combat and the women that were in the armed forces, they, they weren't often in battle. They often weren't on the front lines. They often did either like secretarial work or they did like medical work or they did very limited actions, maybe like right. flying planes or being a fighter, like a fire pilot. It was very limited. The Soviet Union, it's very different where um, the the military is far more um, uh, uh, sort of um, integrated in terms of, of genders. And so Lyudmila Pavlyushenko becomes kind of this genius sniper. Right. Um, and uh, she's really, really good at it. And, and she... Her story is like something out of like a like a novel. It's like she's you know, she's born in you know in in pre revolutionary Russia. You know she grows up in the shadow or not the shadow, but she sort of grows up in the beginnings of the early Soviet Union and and what that represented for people. And you know she uh, she wins a lot of high military awards. Like she you know. And uh, I know it's not like the maybe the best person to meet, but like she's like personally like awarded things by Stalin and, and during the war and right. and so uh, you know and she falls she in was, love. During the, she was yeah. still a, a World War II hero, right? She was still a World <laughs> War II hero, and she's, she's still a hero. Nazis. Today. <laughs> and she's still a hero today. You know, um, you know when you know she, you know, <laughs> there's a great quote from you know when asked when asked how she felt about shooting in cold blood. The men she could see clearly through the sight on her rifle, she merely replied, how can a human being feel when killing a poisonous snake? Mm -hmm. uh, when the Soviet military honored her for a 257 confirmed kill, Pavlyshenko told her superiors, I'll get more. <laughs> um, and so she had 309 confirmed kills. Um, Crazy. And, and uh, which is kind of amazing. There's like, in the book, there's like a picture of her where she's like sit with her sniper and her sniper rifle. And she's like a total badass. Like she's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, and there's like, I think there's like a movie, I don't know what the movie is, but there's like a movie that's like a meme on the internet where it's, it's clearly Ludmilla Pavlyshenko. And this gets into talking about what she would do after her military service, um, where someone asked, asked them, oh, who, hello, who are you? How many, how many men have you killed? And she goes, not men, Nazis. Right. And, uh, and it's like, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty, yeah, you know. that, I think that's um, a good answer. And so uh, there's another thing that's very fascinating is that she was a part of the, as Godsey writes, like the 800,000 women who served in the Soviet armed forces. Like I said, it's very, very integrated. And she also says maybe about a million if you include those who risk their lives as guerrilla fighters with partisans. So partisan fighters were those who um, took up the side of the Soviets in World War II in countries that were occupied by the Nazis. So an example of that is Bulgaria. And then, and that's the story of Elena Lagodinova. And we can talk about that. We'll talk about that later. Um, but, you know, she, you know, she, she's an incredible military uh, uh, asset. She becomes a national hero while she's in military service. She falls in love with okay. a soldier named Alexei Kitsenko. And they have like this, whirlwind romance as they're killing Nazis, which is just kind of awesome. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, she gets injured in battle and he dies in battle. No, oh, no. And so, um, so sh when she's injured in battle, it injures her ability to like lift her arm. Cause I think she gets like shot in the back. So oh, it, okay. it interferes with her ability to effectively hold into a rifle, like as best as she could. And so, the Soviet Union decides they're like, well, she's one of our most decorated soldiers. And so um, she, uh, you know, she receives all of these like high military awards and she is personally asked to be a part of um, a delegation that goes to the United States during the war oh, okay. um, and meet with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady, uh, wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. Um, and it was for what was called the International Student Assembly in Washington, D.C. And so she does this whirlwind, sort of whirlwind tour in the middle of the war in the United States. So it's a very interesting story about like this Soviet sniper who's a woman, which has to like yeah. blow people's minds like in the United States, like because sure. like, of the gender attitudes in the U.S. at the time, like their heads would explode just kind of knowing that. Right. Yeah. And so the the. 
the U.S. kind of press kind of fall in love with her. Like they think she's amazing. She, they think she's great. Um, you know, they call her like the lady sniper and stuff like that. But one of the challenges that she has is that um, she is her sort of her success or her achievements as a soldier are limited by the gender politics of the United States in the way that that, that Americans. Wow. Are. So, and just to, just to, as a quick historical point, most probably know this, but like in world war two, the Soviets and the United States were allies. Yes. Yeah. The that's cold right. war happens later and they're in case you forgot. <laughs> but in case you forgot during world war two, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies. So she goes to, she goes to the United States and she has um, all these like meetings with people and she does radio interviews and she does these events where she goes and she, you know, she receives, you know, she gets a, you know, she, she actually gets a gun from a company in Connecticut. Um, uh, and, uh, and it had, um, it, she it gave her, um, they gave her a, an automatic pistol. Uh, it was the Colt factory in Connecticut. They gave her a pistol oh. and with a bullet that was marked 310 for hopefully she'd get her 310th kill. Oh, okay. Although at that point she was already sort of a, I mean, clearly like, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, just to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit. Like this was also a propaganda effort. Like the right. Soviets sent her in that way. Right. But, you know, but it was, I think interesting. So like, there's all kinds of stuff that she sort of had to deal with. Um, that was kind of nonsensical. Like people would ask her like, you know, why don't you wear more makeup? You know, what kind of like, <laughs> what kind of stockings do you wear? Right. You know, like kind of these sort of female questions. And she's like, why? And they're, they'd be like, why are you wearing a, a military uniform that's too baggy? It doesn't fit you. Like all these kinds of things. Right. And she was just kind of blown away by like how sexist and kind of patronizing this stuff was. Right. Yeah. It's nonsense. My, my favorite story, though, is when she's in – um when she's in the u.s there's a company uh that wants to put her face on cigarettes okay and and she says no and she tells them they can go to the devil which i think is kind of awesome yeah um you know um that was like i think her exact quote quote she's like they can go to the devil nice. um and i love that i just love that that it's like you know you have these like um you know that you have these uh these sort of american capitalists like we want to put you on like a, a cigarette box. And she's like, you can go F yourself, man. Um, I, 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 I think, I, I think that's kind of awesome. Yep. For sure. You know, um, uh, just, uh, we got a couple comments yeah. here. Um, first, uh, some random geek said, Oh yeah, the Soviet sniper. I played her in a medal of honor game, I believe. Oh, cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. And I mean, then, she's, uh, yeah, oh, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, she's probably the most, probably the most decorated female sniper of world war two. Uh, you know, um, not just in confirmed kills, but in like awards from her country. Um, right. uh, mind you not much competition, but you know, because sexism, but you know, yeah. it's the, yeah. And then, uh, Velkin 999 said, there's a good episode of cool people who did cool stuff about her. I think it's a two parter, her and a, fir and a first lady were quote unquote, the best of friends. Oh yeah. She and Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt got on real well. Um, part of that's because Eleanor Roosevelt was very cool in her own right. Um, you know, people often refer to Eleanor Roosevelt as FDR's conscience, which I think is true. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and often vote and often voiced her displeasure in certain policies. Um, especially during the war. I mean, I mean, I think Japanese internment being one of them, very glaring one. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so no, they got along very, very well. And, and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt liked her quite a bit. And again, there you might, have to think, yeah. There might even be a little subtext to that quote unquote, the best of friends. Well, that too. I mean, that too, <laughs> that too. I mean, you know, that's true. You know, just look up like, some of the female friends that Eleanor Roosevelt may have had over the years. Right. Um, you know, you know, and what's so interesting is that, you know, her, you know, her involvement with Roosevelt really changes policy. So she writes in the book about how, um, you know, Roosevelt's friendship with Pavlyshenko may have inspired the former first lady in profound and interesting ways. Um, Roosevelt would later become the chair of the first presidential commission on the status of women in 1961 when JFK was president. Um, 
And uh, because people had realized, oh my God, like the Soviet Union has invested so much time and money and energy into their women and their, and their women are incredible and our women could be better. Like we, you know, like, let, you know, so obviously there's some Cold War calculation. There, right. right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the other part of it is, is that, you know, um, that, you know, in the last public position of her life, Eleanor Roosevelt oversaw the review of 421 pieces of legislation regarding women until her death in November 1962. And the 63 report on American women would come out. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, Pavlyshenko's life um, never really recovers from the war, um, you know, with the loss of her husband and with PTSD. She just, it, it was really, really hard on her. Um, and unfortunately she died at the age of 58, 1974 of a heart attack. Pretty young. And it is, or stroke rather. She died of, uh, died of a stroke. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so, uh, I think that she's a pretty remarkable person and someone that like people, I think people need to recognize that the idea of a soldier fighting for one's country can be beyond just like the male stereotypes that women can also be a part of that fighting. And the thing, right. the other thing to keep up think, you know, is ostensibly she's a working class woman, which is a part of an ostensibly working class political system with yeah. all the limitations that go with that. But like, it's the socialist state, you know, it's state socialism, but it's a social state in which she's a working class person fighting for her country. Um, and while, you know, she might have been a later casualty of the war. She was a casualty of it nonetheless, alongside the you know the, the twenty four to twenty seven million Soviet people who died in World War II more than any yeah. other country. Um, so yeah, I think uh, she was really, really a fascinating lady and and someone yeah. who broke gender stereotypes and got people to think about things differently. And got to kill and killed a lot of Nazis and killed lots of Nazis <laughs> in the process. It's kind of awesome. Like, yep, I, sure. I mean, I mean, if I, like, I, I, what, you know, if I was a person who wouldn't want to love, fall in love with her, like, you right, know, eh? <laughs> cause she was beautiful, yeah. you know, she was beautiful and strong and like, and she killed Nazis. It's kind of awesome. But uh, cool. yeah. yeah. So the next person that we'll talk about is um, Alexander Kollontai, who of the five that we were going to talk about tonight, she was the one I was the most familiar with before reading this book. So Colin Tai is probably one of the most famous political figures of the early Soviet era. Um, okay. She was very involved in the beginnings of the, the early, uh, uh, the Bolshevik revolution and in the Soviet, early Soviet government under Lenin. And she would become, uh, she would continue that influence well into the, the 1940s and fifties um, when she became a diplomat. Um, but she is somebody whose story is a little bit different than Pavlyshenko. So, you know, Pavlyshenko grows up more in a working class family. Kalantai is not. She grows up in more of a wealthy sort of uh, liberal class, liberal sort of oriented family in, um, you know, when she's born, uh, I believe in 1872, you okay. know, and so she comes from what Godsey describes as a liberal arist aristocratic family. And, um, and so, you know, she, um, you know, she was exposed to politics early on through her father, um, who uh, was sent to the Balkans to help write a constitution for the Bulgarian state, um, okay. which had been liberal, newly liberated from the Ottoman Empire in 1878. She went with him. So she's like this young person learning from another political figure being her father. Reminds me very much of a very, very different figure in John Quincy Adams, who was mm. the son of John Adams, the second president of the United States, um, who went to Russia as a young man and then would become sort of an ambassador to Russia in early U.S. history. Um, so he's somebody sort of exposed early on because of his father, who was also a diplomat. Same with her, same with her dad. Um, and so she's very influenced by um, a couple of, of key works of socialist theory. Maybe these are two books we can cover on the show later on in, in other episodes, but one of them is August Babel's book, um, Woman, and Women, uh, Woman and Socialism. Okay. And the other book is, and the, probably the more famous book is Friedrich Engels' book, The Origin of Family, Private Property, and the State. Okay. And so she sort of learns about how material conditions – often set the parameters of um, gender norms. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of learns a little bit about that. 
And so she becomes, uh, you know, kind of radicalized by this and it sort of makes her a communist, right? And so she writes her own pamphlet called The Social Basis of the Woman Question in 1909. Um, and, um, and I'm going to just read a quote from it because I think it's awesome. I won't do many readings tonight, but this one's good. Okay. Um, where she writes, On the ruins of the former family, we shall soon behold rising a new form which will involve altogether different relations between men and women, and which will be a union of affection and comradeship, a union of two equal persons of the communist society, both of them free, both of them independent, both of them workers. No more domestic servitude for women. No more inequality within the family. No more fear on the part of the woman to remain without support or aid with the little ones in her arms if her husband should desert her. The woman in the communist city no longer depends on her husband, but on her own work. It is not her husband, but her robust arms which will support her. So there's a lot there to kind of unpack in her mm. own sort of conceptions of gender politics and sexuality. So right away, you know, when I'm reading this passage, it reminds me of when we talked about Bertrand Russell's book um, in, in Praise of Idleness, where he's talking about sort of the future social society where we can set up places where, you know, children can have daycare centers and good health care and the parents can work and then spend like their most quality time with their children and, and have an equal part in the family. Yeah. She's kind of saying the same thing around the same time, right. um, albeit in a little bit more radical way, right? Because, because, you know, like, Russell was like a Fabian socialist and she's a full-blown communist. So it's yeah. different. Um, one of the things that's really influential there is when she's talking about um, union of affection and comradeship. This is really key. So, you know, at the time, and, and in some respects, I think still today, a lot of people enter into marriages not because they love the person or that they have a deep friendship or they have a deep companionship, but for economic reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, at, sometimes it's men marrying rich women or rich women marrying or women marrying rich men. Um, there's a term for that, which is called hypergamy, which is when you marry above one station. Okay. Um, that's a term I learned from, uh, Gore Vidal. I know that, I know that from the, uh, the men's rights team, oh, really? men, the manosphere, cause they, the manosphere? they say women are hypergamous. That's, See, that's, that's her, bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, we got to Okay. No, we gotta sure. adopt, we're going to adopt. We're, we're absolutely <laughs> stopping the car and pulling over for a minute. That's absolute bullshit. And yep. I'll tell you that. Do you want to know who was the most hypergamous figure of American history? Was Abraham Lincoln. Ah. Lincoln, who was born in a log cabin, didn't have pot to piss in. You know, his right. mom dies when he's young. His father remarries to a woman who's illiterate. But who comes with books and she she passes on a desire for education to Lincoln. But the key thing is Lincoln marries Mary Todd. Right. Yep. And Mary Todd is a part of the illustrious and wealthy Todd family, the Todds of Kentucky. Right. Who own a fucking slave plantation. I mean, it's it's right. So it's it's kind of a divided house. But but Lincoln marries her. You know, he loves her. He cares about her. But he marries her for a few reasons. One, she he's tied into the, the Todd family who have connections to Henry Clay, who is Lincoln's political idol. Okay. So there's that. Then you have the fact that she, she came from a wealthy background. She had been, she had been educated at private schools that she could speak multiple languages. She was extremely politically shrewd. So Lincoln married up and in marrying up, it pretty much <laughs> cemented what could come later, which is him becoming president of the United States. For sure. Like, I'm yeah. sorry, but hypergamy goes both ways. Yeah, it's not sure. just something women do; men do it too. You yeah, know, and right. I'll tell you who did. Arguably, one the most influential American president in history was hypergamous. <laughs> so, I mean, come on, man. Yeah, come on. No, it's uh, so uh, stupid. Uh, Velkin nine 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 says, "I never thought I'd hear the, uh, the man in the sphere mentioned." Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a guilty, it's a guilty pleasure of mine or guilty frustration of mine. I don't know. I, I pay too much attention to that stuff. Hey, <laughs> we all have to find things that we expose people to so they know how insane they are. Right. 
Yeah. I first learned of the concept of hypergamy in relation to Lincoln and 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 Gore Vidal and like reading about Lincoln that way. <laughs> but yeah, no. We we got yeah. some other good comments. Uh, some random geek just said, knowing Corey, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good, man. I'm a Scientology watcher, so it's like we we're all we all have our things that we're kind of weirdly obsessed with. Um, yeah, it's like I I feel like it goes hand in hand with my edu- my self education about feminism. I, I watch the Manosphere and I pay attention to those guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so you know, Colin Ty's politics were really wrapped up in the idea of. And this doesn't sound that radical today, but it was fairly radical 100 years ago, 100 plus years ago, is the idea that in a socialist society or a communist society, people would be able to have partners because they loved them and they cared about them and not for economic reasons. That they could, they could, they didn't have to enter into arranged marriages. They could get out of marriages that were abusive, that they could, um, that they could really change things. And, and in many respects, much like with Pavlyshenko, Kalantai's ideas become practice in the early years of the Soviet Union. A lot of the things that we talk about when people talk about like the good things of the Soviet Union in the early years, talking about like the decriminalization of homosexuality and the legalization of abortion and these kinds of things and, and getting rid of oppressive divorce laws, a lot of these are tied to Kalantai's political activism and her own okay. ideas. So she is she's she becomes three days after the Russian Revolution, she is named the Commissar for Social Welfare. And in that role, she starts helping develop a slew of reforms to civil society in the form of marriage. So about a year later, they pass the highest legislative body in the Soviet Union incorporated decrees into a new family law. It was a code of laws concerning civil registration of deaths, births, and marriages. And essentially what it did was it helped um, kind of uh, liberalize uh, marriages. Marriages became civil functions rather than merely religious or church functions, um, which was uh, which was absolutely revolutionary in terms of overturning a lot of the patriarchal systems of oppression in the forms of church sanctioned marriages because they were the only ones that could officiate them or, or sanction them. Um, you know, she also... Uh, starts to do all kinds of things that sound very similar to what we talked about with Russell, where she's like proposing like this network of like community run state laundries, cafeterias, children's centers, all these kinds of things. Right. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen. Part of that's right. because of the, the Russian civil war and the new economic plan. And then with Lenin's death in 24 and Stalin's rise to power, a lot of the liberal liberalizations of the, of the, of the earlier Bolshevik period are, are overturned. Um, and not especially when it came to abortion um, and more traditional gender roles come into play during the Stalin period. Right. Now, unfor- now fortunately for Kalantai, she was somebody who kind of survived the purges of the 30s. But the way that she kind of did that um, was uh, she would become a diplomat. So um, she she becomes a diplomat. I think she becomes like the ambassador to like – Finland, um, one of the Scandinavian countries, and she, um, and so she becomes very, very influential in that way and okay. helps people. Um, in fact, there's this kind of beautiful story about um, an American, uh, the the child of people who escaped um, the Holocaust. Um, who and there's a story about these these two uh, the, the, this Jewish couple who are trying to get out of um, Germany. They're trying to get out of Europe um, and trying to get away. And she um, and uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so it's Sweden. She was the ambassador to Sweden. Okay. Um, so basically. She she saw these two people because the, the the Nazis were about to o- overrun um, Norway, and so oh, these okay. people are trying to escape from persecution and, and potentially the death camps, and they don't have like a full like visa from like the Russian consulates so that they can leave. Okay, and Kalantai basically says she kind of looks at them and she goes, "I don't care. Get them the, the documents that they need, and, and get them what they need." Um, and, and, uh, so she, she says, so it's like, she, he kind of explained the situation and it's like, give them two. 
And the author, Kristen Godsey, meets the son of these two people. Oh, neat. In the U.S. And, um, and, and the professor who said to him, said to her, like, Madame Kalantai is a hero of our family because she saved my parents' lives. Right. About her. Wow. That's kind of a little, like, microcosm of her humanity, of this moment of sheer barbarity in the Holocaust. And, you know, she saved these two people. Um, and it's kind of beautiful, really, um, sure. and, and amazing. And so, um, you know, by the time she gets into the 1940s, and she's a diplomat for many, many years and a very accomplished one. So, you know, her career is sort of interesting in that early on, she's a theorist of sort of gender and, and sexual politics. She becomes a civil servant as people's commissar. <clears throat> she institutes reforms and then becomes a diplomat during sort of the Stalin period and avoids a lot of the, 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 the political excesses. Right. Uh, because she was certainly to the left of, of Stalin ones. Right. Um, she dies in 1952, um, right before 80th birthday. birthday. Um, and, uh, she and lived I a long life then. That's pretty good. She lived a rather long life, yeah. So, um, and she was, you know, in many respects, extremely successful. Um, and she was twice, twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize um, for her negotiation of the Soviet Finnish peace after the... Uh, after the winter war. Oh. So, um, and so why is it that this woman, this incredibly accomplished woman who argued for breaking down traditional gender stereotypes and liberation of women and was an accomplished diplomat. It's like, no one knows who she is. Cause she you was know, a communist. <laughs> it's because she's a communist. It's yeah. because she's a Soviet and that, you know, she was a Bolshevik, you know? And the thing is like her being in that position of like commissar um, in 1917, like, Lenin personally appointed her to that position. It wasn't like it was kind of like whatever. Like you know, they they knew each other well, and like that was a thing, right? So like it's. I just think it's really interesting. Her story is very very interesting. So you have Pavlashenko, the lady sniper. We've got Kalantai, who's this you know theorist who wants to break the bonds of of economic slavery in the marriage and in the home and make marriages and, and relationships more about love and companionship. Um, you know, her ideas on a lot of that stuff seem actually rather quaint today and kind of cute, but they, for their time, they were extremely radical. For sure. Yeah. Um, because and in I mean, some aspects, they're still pretty radical today. Like in essence, they are still very radical. Right. Um, so that is – that's Alexander Kalantai. Um, that's lady number two. Um, do we have any comments before we move on to our next – No new comments. Nope. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on to the next one, um, uh, to our next uh, incredible revolutionary woman. Her name is Nehezda Krupskaya. And she is extremely important um, because she is essentially the first lady of the Soviet Union. She is Lenin's wife. Um, and, but she's so much more than that. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, sorry. Okay. I gotta bring up this new comment. New comment. Still enjoying the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Random Geek. We really appreciate you being here. Um, so Nehezda Kripskaya, who is an incredible figure in her own right, but yes, she was Lenin's wife. She was okay. Lenin's secretary. Um, she was more sort of small C conservative in her own personal views than say a Kalantai, um, but nevertheless was a dedicated revolutionary. And what her real influence was, um, uh, you know, she, like Kalantai, she's somebody that does survive the Stalinist purges, partially because how could Stalin purge Lenin's wife? That would that look would, particularly that, good. That would look pretty bad. Yeah. Not, and not just like Lenin's wife, but like one of the architects of the Bolshevik revolution in her own right. And like, because when you read about Kripskaya in this book and in others, and you get a sense of her relationship with Lenin, it's it's a very close one, and and it's based on love and mutual respect. But it's also that she was deeply brilliant too, and so she's somebody who is giving him advice and counsel and editing his ideas and and helping draft transcripts for him and and, and works as, as sort of a secretary but also bringing her own unique contributions into it. Like, I just think that's really, really cool. It's very similar to, to Eleanor Roosevelt in that regard. And that Eleanor okay. Roosevelt, you could say that Kripskaya in some respects was also, was Lenin's conscience, 
very much like like Eleanor Roosevelt was FDR's conscience. Um, so she's born in 1869. She's actually a little slightly older than Lenin, who was born in, in April of 1870. Um, and uh, you know, she was also born in Imperial Russia. Um, and you know, she um, she um, her her parents were were impoverished nobles, um, but they much like Kalantai's family, they were sort of liberal in their broader outlook, um, and they encouraged education in 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 her, in her, and their daughter. Um, and she is, as, as, um, Godsey writes, she says, intelligent, hardworking, Kripskaya achieved the highest level of education available to her in Russia at the time. Um, diligent student, uh, you know, she, um, she taught, um, schools for factory workers. So she is, she's as, as Kristen Godsey calls it, she's the radical pedagogue. When we're, you know, she is the teacher who sort of creates, the educational system in the Soviet Union. That's who she is. Ah. And, and so she is, you know, so she writes, she also writes pamphlets and discusses like the, the, the grueling work conditions that women endure under Russian capitalism pre-1917. A pamphlet called The Woman Worker kind of goes into that. Um, and uh, she wrote probably one of the most uh, important memoirs of the Soviet period, which is her reminiscences of Lenin. So it's okay. kind of like, it's kind of like a document that people often refer to, to discuss, especially Lenin's later years and the sort of political schisms between him and Stalin. Um, okay. People often refer to Trotsky, but they also refer to Gripskaya's own memoirs um, because uh, uh Short, the, 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 the sort of Cliff Notes version of it is that um, there's a letter that Lenin wrote to Stalin. And we will actually talk a little bit more about this next in our next episode when we do Leninism under Lenin by Marcel Liebman. But there's like an incident where like Stalin is like a complete dick to her. <laughs> and, and, and Lenin, who is nearly an invalid at this point, he's had multiple strokes, writes like Stalin this like really nasty letter where he's like, how I'm dare sure. you treat my wife this way? And uh, it's it's kind of incredible, um, uh, but but basically, you know, she you know she meets Lenin, and uh, in 1894, uh, and they sort of you know did they have like the most intense romance? No, but they certainly loved each other. They certainly had an affection for one another, um, despite the fact that they they ne they never had children. Um, we got a, we got oh, a, yeah. an actual uh, a question from uh, sure. Nine Nine Nine. I didn't know Lenin had a wife. When did they marry? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if they actually like formally married or not. I got to look in my notes real quick. Um, but ah, uh, here we go. Um, so like in, in in essence, they both so Lenin and Krupskaya both become political prisoners in the eighteen nineties. They spent some time in Siberia and. Uh, they used to actually write each other letters in invisible milk ink. So like they would write like letters that were like really boring. And then, but in between the lines was milk ink that if you like, um, that if you, uh, you sort of, if, I think it's something along the lines, like if you put it like in front of a fire, then the, 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 the milk ink would show up and then you could see the real letter. Ah. So they wrote that kind of stuff to each other. Um, and so like, I don't know if they were ever like formally married but they, but, um, but like at the time, uh, in terms of like a state marriage, because those didn't really exist in the Soviet Union, I mean, in Russia pre Soviet period, right. but they were, um, they did, they did get married at an Orthodox wedding ceremony, um, in the summer of 1898. Um, okay. but you know, about a couple of years or a couple of years before a year and a half before you see it as, um, they just, just sort of described. Kripskaya as like Lenin's political fiance. And that kind of gets into what I was sort of mentioning earlier, which is that Kripskaya and Lenin have a romance. There's no doubt about that, but it's not like a hot and heavy one. It's, mm. it's not Pavlyshenko and her, you know, her, her stunning Valkyrie soldier boy, you know, and, uh, but they do have a, they do have a deep abiding love for each other and they have a deep love and abiding, a deep abiding love for the revolution. And the right. idea of pursuing the revolution, right? So this is where she becomes incredibly influenced, influential, um, and uh, and so they. So when the revolution happens, 
um, she uh, she becomes in many respects uh, the key uh, educational reformer of the so- Soviet Union and the early Soviet system. Um, apparently, uh, uh, Godsey described her as like a wizard of logistics. Like she was really good at like planning things and laying things out, which I think is apt. I mean, I could imagine why Lenin would have a certain affinity for that because he did a lot of the same thing right? Um, in terms of planning. Um, and so, uh, so she starts uh, organizing adult literacy courses um, uh, during the sort of period of the, between the revolutions. And then after the revolutions happen, um, she becomes the deputy minister and in charge of adult education um, in the new Commissariat of Enlightenment, the Soviet name for the Ministry of Education. And there she works with the Ukrainian revolutionary Anatoly Lunacharsky. Um, and this is really, she starts developing these sort of radical democratic pedagogies. So we think of somebody like Paulo Freire, the, mm. the, 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 the educational theorist, the idea of like the, the pedagogy of the oppressed. Yeah. There's a very clear connecting tissue between uh, Freire's ideas and that sort of radical pedagogical tradition and Kripskaya, who was doing the same thing in right. the early Soviet period. Um, and so she's um, – so one thing that she would do that I think is – is like kind of cute is like she would um they would sort of uh instead of have like people like teach people how to read instead of doing literacy courses instead of giving them like children's books of the bible they gave them the communist manifesto yeah nice and it, and it's kind of great right because it's like because first off like in general um you know like of a lot of marxist theory like the communist manifesto is one of the most is the more is a more accessible thing to read for sure um and it lays out a lot of the key ideas of marxism in a very concise and clear way and so you know here is this you know radical woman who you know alexander kollontai was very beautiful and she wore beautiful makeup and she had beautiful outfits and it was very stylish kripskaya is the opposite you know she doesn't wear a lot of makeup puts her hair back in a quick bun whereas more drab clothes, doesn't really care. You know, she's more dedicated to the revolutionary project in that regard. She's not really one for frills. This is where she and Lenin are very alike because Lenin was kind of the same way. I mean, they always tell the story of right before he goes back to Russia in April of 1917 to the Finland station, right? Uh, They, they, um, they decide Lenin, we have to get you a new suit. You know, if if you're going to be the leader of this revolution, you cannot be wearing these drab clothes. And, and he's like, no, 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 I don't need a new suit. I don't need a new suit. And, uh, and he finally concedes. He goes, fine, fine. I'll get this new suit. So they go and they buy him this suit. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's the suit that you see in all the pictures. It's, that's the suit. So he had that same, same kind of it's the one suit that he, <laughs> the one suit that he had. Right. And this guy was kind of the same way. She was like, I don't really care about any of that crap. I'm more, much more interested in teaching people and the revolution right right and so you know she is somebody who you know she helped really set up um the librarian libra- library system in the soviet union she's nice. kind of the, the key figure who helps set, set up all these librarian libraries helps train librarians um and sort of get people to uh you know ex- like does mass literacy on a very large scale Nice. Um, and uh, it was pretty incredible stuff. Um, and so, you know, she would she would give comments on like textbooks that they would approve for schools, and and like I said, she does the library program. You know, unfortunately, her political career is in many respects kind of a casualty of the Stalinist era, as much as Colin Tice is. Um, you know, after um, you know after <laughs> Lenin's. Oh, go ahead. But. Velkin 999, uh, now I'm head cannoning Lenin never showering. I'll shower when the revolution is over. Revolution is over. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, there's a great story about when they're on the train headed towards Finland Station in 1917 that uh, too many men were taking breaks, smoking breaks in the bathroom, and Lenin hated it 
because he didn't like smoking and he was trying to work. So he's like in the other compartment next to the bathroom. And so at some point he says, no, we're not just letting anybody just go in there and smoke all the time. So they set up like a smoking schedule where guys would kind of come in when they, when they at certain times and in certain things, Oh yeah, because he had work to do. Um, yeah. But, uh, so Lennon absolutely did not like enough with your smoking. addictions. I have shit enough to with do. your addictions. I have shit to do. Um, but yes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wear a new suit. When the dictatorship of the proletariat has been established. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I, I find these kind of stories endearing because like, yes, like Lenin is an extremely complicated figure and we can have that, but it humanizes them in a way that I think is important. Cause I think for most people, they think of Lenin as just like a statue. Yeah. It's like Lincoln. It's the same thing where they don't yeah. think of him as a person, you know, yeah. the, the embodiment of Soviet Russia. The embodiment right. of Soviet Russia, like very much like American, Abraham Lincoln is like, being. yeah, it very much like how Abraham Lincoln is like the embodiment of America, right? Right, yeah. But we can't imagine Lincoln like, you know, when he's early, when he's dating Mary Todd, going up to her and saying, I want to dance with you in the worst way. And not in, and not in the sense of like, you know, so he knows he's like, I'm really bad at dancing, but I really want to dance with you. So I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and, and I kind of love that. Those, those humanizing moments I think are important for historical figures. It helps people learn about them more too. For sure. So unfortunately her sort of, her sort of radical pedagogical ideas get limited by the Stalinist period where they wanted to institute more standardized education that would create sort of compliant and efficient workers um, and so um, after Lenin's death in 1924, because she cares for him in the final years of his life among a team of other people, um, you know, she, uh, you know, she just kind of unfortunately became uh, sort of a casualty of that period, even though, you know, she was never, you know, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't really put on trials. She wasn't a part of the the, the show Trials of the 30s. She wasn't executed or anything like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And yeah. Um, and so I think that um, that uh, she was kind of somebody who there could have been so much more that there could have been a much more open and sort of uh, inquisitive and and uh, critical thinking educational system in Russia um, and in the Soviet Union. But unfortunately, it was sort of a casualty of yeah. um, Soviet era. But nevertheless, um, you know, she's somebody who, um, you know, stuck to her guns and fought for these reforms and in many, many ways was, you know, this, you know, I mean, she was this towering figure, right? You know, because once Lenin was gone, right, the, the, you know, the, Stalin liked to make the argument that he was like the kind of the closest person to, to Lenin. And that's not really true. It was her. Right. She was. Yeah. You know, she is like, you know, she became this kind of living symbol of the revolution. Um, and she lives until 1939. Uh, okay. So she, so she lived for, for a very, very long time. Um, and so, you know, after the thaw of the 1950s, after Khrushchev comes into power, a lot of her books and articles and ideas become a key component of Soviet life again and they become a part of the the pedagogy of the Soviet Union um and uh what's interesting too is that between 1970 and 1992 the Soviet Union sponsored the UNESCO Nehezda K Kripskaya Literary Prize and to this day Russians can still savor a domestically produced Kripskaya chocolate bar which is kind of cute <laughs> um but yeah no she was very important and the and and, and the 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 incredible influence that she had on on literally ch millions of children in terms right. of teaching kids how to read, teaching workers how to read, because you know I don't I don't know what this is like as somebody who's highly literate. I don't know what it's like to be someone who can't read yeah. or can't read well. You know, um, and that's got to be heartbreaking. You know, and and so you know. We in the United States, like we kind of don't give a shit about literacy. It's not something we, we pride ourselves on. I mean, you know, Cuba is a more literate country than we are. And that's right. no disrespect to, to Cuba. That's more of a dig on us. But um, but I think it's it's, you know, I think that we can look at Kripskaya as a good as a good example of that um, yeah. and, and who she was. Um, I know we're getting close to the hour mark, so I'll try to get through the next couple of these fairly quick. Do we have any comments? Uh, no, no, we're good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, but thank you for watching, if you're still watching. So the last two we'll talk about are Anessa Armand and um, Elena Lagodinova. So Armand 
Um, she was described as the hot Bolshevik. <laughs> okay. Um, of of the five, she's the one that dies fairly young. She dies in her forties, I think. Okay. Um, but she was very connected to Lenin and Krupskaya. Okay. So you know, her main role was you know, and and you know, she was born in eighteen seventy four, so around the same time as as Krupskaya and Lenin. She becomes, um, you know, she's also um, she's also French. So like she's like a French Soviet. It's you know, so she's kind of a little that's why her name is the more like Western Europe rather than Eastern Europe. Right. Um, you know, she had uh you know, she had five children. You know, she was connected to she was somebody who was hypergamous and that she did marry a wealthy guy. Um okay. you know. Um, but uh but didn't really stay with him particularly long and eventually leaves him and, and falls in love with somebody else. Um and but she's really connected to her son Alexander, and the the thing that, the thing about her is that um, people often speculate about whether or not Armand was Lenin's mistress. Um, there's not really good evidence to suggest one way or the other. It's kind of muddled. Um, so it's rumors and yeah, it's like kind that. of rumors and kind of hearsay. It's not like nothing's like definite. Um, but, uh, but, but Armand and Kripskaya and Lenin were very tight as a group, um, and kind of all influenced each other. And, you know, she was, she was instrumental before the revolution for setting up the Moscow society for the improvement of a lot of women. She wrote less than some of these other, um, uh, uh figures. Part of that was because, um, Lenin, and this is, I think, uh, I think a criticism of him. And a criticism of him in relation both to Armand and to Kripskaya, but like he would often say, like, um, you know, I need your help with this right now. I can't have you doing this other work. Oh. Um, so there's so there's a lot of that where it's like, I need you now to do this for the revolution. I can't have you writing your own shit. So there's a little bit of a sexism there in the yeah, sense of like that's not, you know, not, not as cool, but <laughs> that's not as cool. But it's honest. I mean, that's the, really the way it was. Um, Armand was strikingly beautiful. I mean, she was a very beautiful woman. She had this sort of beautiful, sort of almost aquiline nose and, and kind of very beautiful hair. And she, she was always very elegant. She was a very elegant person. Um, okay. And that's one of the things that kind of connects like the three three of the women in the book, you know, uh, uh, you know, Kalantai. And, well, Kantai and Armand are probably the most that are kind of similar in the sense that they come from that sort of upper upper class background. Um, but they were people who were sort of class traders. They were like, you know, I come yeah. from that, so I know it better than anybody, and I can tell you it sucks. Um, and so, you know, she, um, you know, she, um, she's just she's really a key figure of that early years where Kripskaya was was connected to Lenin and helped him as a secretary and as an advisor. And as, like I said, as some people speculate, um, uh, his lover, but there's no really good evidence yeah. for that. And she kind of falls out of, like, she kind of falls out of the picture around the time of the revolution. Okay. Um, and, and sort of kind of goes her own way. Um, and then, uh, you know, sadly, you know, she died, um, in 1920, she died of cholera. Oh, okay. um, so she died at the height of the Russian civil war. Ah. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, she kind of felt like, uh, she was sort of stifled by some of the limitations of the Soviet society and the Bolshevik revolution and Lenin and kind of, uh, kind of, uh, it, it's more tragic. Her story is probably the more tragic and the more ambiguous of right. the five. Yeah. You know, there's not as much of a clear influence beyond just like she was very influential in the early years with Lenin and Krupskaya. Um, but she was important enough in that she was an important sounding board for both Lenin and Krupskaya and for them to articulate their own ideas and same with her. And again, it's trying to push those gender boundaries. Uh, and the last person we'll talk about is probably the most contemporaneous. She only died in, in 2017. Oh, um, and she's one that Godsey um, was very connected to. Um, when Godsey was working, I think, on her graduate research or her PhD, she got to know uh, our last person very, very well. And because that was her research subject. So our last person we're going to talk about tonight is Elena Lagodinova. 
Um, Elena Lagodinova is Bulgarian, so she's a part okay. of Bulgaria rather than like the Soviet Union proper, but it's all a part of sort of Eastern Europe, Soviet bloc countries. And um, so she's born in 1930. So she's born, you know, uh, you know, she, as, as Godsey writes, a, tr a true red diaper baby, Lagodinova was born into a poor family of committed socialist revolutionaries. Um, and so she, uh, so she kind of grew up in this milieu of radical politics, right? you know, more so than, you know, Armand or Colin Tyre or, or Kripskaya. She's kind of born into this a lot like um, uh, Pavlyshenko was. Right. And she becomes well known during World War II when uh, the Bulgarian government or the sort of the Bulgarian regime was in league with the Nazis. And so she fought with oh. the sort of the Soviets as a part of the partisans. These were the people who were trying to take their country back from the fascists. Right. And, um, and so she, uh, you know, she, so she becomes a partisan fighter um, during the war. And, and then after the war, um, she becomes a very um, accomplished uh, scientist. Um, and uh, and writes a tremendous amount of research relating to agriculture um, in the 1950s and 1960s. So she's so she becomes she's this young partisan soldier fighting against the fascists in Bulgaria, and then she then becomes this incredibly accomplished and successful and lauded agricultural scientist. Hmm. Um, and so she writes about wheat. She writes about. Uh, Triticale, um, which is, I think, a form of, 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 uh, of a grain. Um, and she, uh, and so she sort of is this sort of scientific figure. And then eventually that kind of morphs into being a political figure okay. because people could see how intelligent she was and how capable she was, not just as a scientist, but as an administrator. Because that's the thing you often find with intellectuals is some people are 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 really intelligent and can speak about a subject, but when it comes to like administrative tasks or the sort of the nuts and bolts of governing, they're not great at it. Right. Um, she was, and so um, so she becomes uh, yeah, she she becomes more and more involved in politics, and as she does that, she starts um, really starting to uh, like set up. Um, these organizations and, and events. And eventually this would lead in um, the, something that she would kind of help organize, which was like the women's committee um, and sort of discussing the problems of working class women in the Soviet Union and how to improve their lives. Um, and then she was also um, very integral in the international um development of women's human rights. So she's oh, part cool. of the sort of the UN decade for women, which is from 76 to 85. Um, and, you know, she was, uh, she was very uh, influential in a Politburo decision in the 1970s called enhancing the role of women in the building in, of a developed social society. So again, she's somebody who's at the corner at the sort of the intersections of both like policy and politics where it's, you know, cause sometimes those aren't always the same thing. And, uh, and this all kind of culminates um, in her wanting to build sort of a, a international network of women. And so uh, she uh, starts to have these, you know, you know, really interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, events where these women would come from all over the world and, and would sort of learn from each other and would learn from their different cultures. Um, to bring it back to where we had at the beginning, this is where she meets Angela Davis in the 1970s. Okay. She, you know, Angela Davis visited Bulgaria in 1972 and met Elena Lagodinova. And, um, and so she was very influential in that way too. Um, and so uh, in 1968, just to kind of back it up just a little bit, um, she becomes the president of that committee of the Bulgarian women's movement. And that's where okay. she starts. That's like the official title. And that's where she builds. And that builds really to her leading the Bulgarian delegation 
um, to the United Nations First World Conference on Women for International Women's Year in Mexico City, and this is in 1975. Um, and so she's leading this delegation of women who are representing um, Bulgaria at a very crucial time in history right. and connecting with other nations. Um, you know, nearly a decade later, she leads them at the United Nations Third World Conference on Women in Kenya. Um, she starts, um, you know, she starts uh, uh, making those connections with anti-colonial struggles in Africa. Oh yeah, and making connections with women who were part of those anti-colonial struggles in Africa in the 1970s and 80s. And so she is somebody who is kind of everything. She's kind of a little bit of, of the right. other people we've talked about tonight, right? She's got the scholarship of a Krupskaya, but then she's got the political passions of a Kalantai, but then she also has like the, the public facing role that Pavlyshenko had, you know? And then she was very sort of, she provided like uh, guidance and, and ideas to the government like Armand did. Right. And so she is, you know, she's somebody who is deeply influential and, and seen as that. And unfortunately, you know, her political career was was cut short by the end of the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, so when the Soviet Union starts to collapse in 1989, the Bulgarian socialist government sort of collapses and she's forced into retirement a year later. The Soviet Union, of course, collapses on you know, December 25th, 1991. And uh and unfortunately, you know, the a lot of her successes, because they were part of the Soviet period, which ended, were again not seen as much as the ones of, say, like bourgeois feminist right, right. leaders. Right. So so Pavlyshenko was somebody, or not Pavlyshenko, but Lagodinova was was somebody who um, was a scholar and a politician and a partisan. You know, and 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 fighting against the Nazis, a long sort of uh, illustrious career, and she dies in in 2017, um, at the age of I think like 86 or 87. Right. Um, and uh, and so uh, and she was also like acquaintances with uh, former Governor Jerry Brown of California. There's a picture of her and Jerry Brown in this picture oh. when she comes to the states and visits. Um, and so, uh, because, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the connection there is, but, but they sort of connected, I think through, I think maybe the 1985 conference or something like that. Okay. Um, but, um, but yeah, so if we look at the history of these five women, you know, Lyudmila Pavlyshenko, Alexandra Kalantai, Nehezda Krupskaya, Anessa Armand, and Ale Elena Lagodinova, we see a very rich history For of sure. Soviet women who, and, and socialist women who advance the cause of women's rights and human rights, not just for their part of the world, but for all of the world, um, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, these are the kind of figures you want to learn a little bit more about, you know, because everybody right. kind of knows about like the Susan B. Anthony's and the, the Elizabeth Cady Stanton's or whatever, um, or, you know, in, in European terms, if you're thinking of, you know, I don't know, somebody like, uh, uh, oh God, um, What's her name? Crap. Who was also a scientist who became uh, Angela Merkel, former chancellor of Germany, um, uh, or, you know, Hillary Clinton barf. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, but these, this is a rich revolutionary tradition. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, that I think people should learn more about. And I hope that they've kind of given you a little bit of a foray of that tonight. Very cool. So, uh, I guess, what are we covering next time? Um, what we're covering next time is we're going to be covering Leninism Under Lenin by Marcel Liebman, um, which I'm just going to say it, other than Lenin's own writings, might be the best book about Lenin I've ever read. Okay. Um, I think it's absolutely incredible. I think it's an extremely balanced portrait of Lenin and his revolution and the revolution in, in Russia and the early years of the Soviet government, its strengths, its weaknesses, um, and its ultimate sort of perversion cool. under Stalin. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I look forward to um, really getting into that. That was a recommendation from our uh, longtime viewer, uh, Kerrigan, um, recommended the book um, along with a few other ones. And it was the one that kind of the title of it grabbed me and I went, okay, we're going to do that book. Um, right. And nice. uh, I, I absolutely loved it. So I, I look forward to talking about that. Um, not in two weeks, but in about a month, um, we're taking a slight hiatus um, because in two weeks will be my wife's birthday. 
So uh, <laughs> we're taking a little hiatus so we can go do something special for a birthday. Um, but totally then we'll fair. be back. But we'll be back uh, in about a month to do Leninism under Lenin. Right on. And I guess all that's left then is where can people find you? So people can find me at justinclark.org. That's the website right down there. Um, you can find all episodes of the podcast there. Um, Corey just released a new episode, uh, uh, a, a new edited episode yeah. um, of American Crusade about the uh, right wing Christian nationalist takeover of the Supreme Court, its consequences for democracy. Um, I think that was a really interesting episode and, and, and uh, people should definitely check that out, especially what's going on in U.S. politics right now. For sure. Um, uh, and um, uh, I will be working on a variety of different sort of articles and different things. Um, and uh, we'll, I've been doing a lot of different things for work. So, you know, maybe I'll be doing more, more sort of straight, straight history stuff over the next few months. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, you can definitely check everything out there. Um, and then as I always say at the end, um, please consider becoming a patron. Um, Corey works very, very hard to make not just our incredible full episodes, but all the Patreon material. I mean, you guys get, you get so much more if you're a patron, you get the pregame, you get the post game, you get a lot of really cool stuff. Like for every hour we're on here, you get like two extra hours pretty much every time. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Cause I can't find a way to shut up, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, and, and so, yeah, we tend to talk about other things. Um, but yeah, definitely become a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I will, I will not always put that as a question. I'll get that memorized. <laughs> at some point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, definitely become a patron and then also, um, keep following me, uh, check us, check me out on social media. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm on all major platforms except for Twitter because to hell with Elon Musk, but, um, but I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok, threads, blue sky, um, at Justin Clark, PH, PH stands for public history. Um, you can follow me there, um, where I've been doing other book reviews and books that I've been reading outside of the show. Um, and I've also been doing some videos, um, not my own videos, as well as clips that Corey has put together from the show, um, that are really great too. So, um, so yeah, that's where you guys can find me. Uh, just a couple of comments at the very end. Sure. Uh, some random geek said, Justin, I rarely find a way to shut up either. It's true, man. I get it. It's, it's, it's tough. It's really tough when, when you got a lot on your mind and you can't help it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for joining us in the chat and uh, viewing it on the live stream. And thank you, Justin, for joining me. Thank you everybody so much for your great comments and questions. And thank you, Corey, as always, my friend. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who share, supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to all my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of the patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a Patreon and want to contribute to that, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a sub stack where you can subscribe for free, or you can donate once, donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes that is on Patreon. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my so stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Uh, make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website, join your local org, print off some pa posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat.
this indispensable nation among nations that was deeply moral and committed to human rights. And as we've seen, and even just in my own lifetime, and I'm not old, and both of us, neither one of us is yeah. really old, and we've lived this experience is to know that like that is an absolute fiction. Like that's not yeah. true at all. Yeah, it's a it's a hundred percent myth, right? Like every that's the thing. Like when I hear clips like of news clips or whatever from the past of like media correspondents or whatever talking shit about like Cubo or even DPRK, which I'm not a fucking fan of. Same. Like <laughs> like or or any of the previous uh, enemies of the United States. They talk about all oh, human rights violations and all oh, how, you know, we have to do this and we, we have to do that. And I'm just going like, but you don't respect human rights. Yeah. Like you're arresting people in your own country for spe- saying things that you don't like, for protesting in situations that you don't like. Your, mur- your police murder people regularly. 